Part nine, this is the last part for this um, session. We'll continue tomorrow, part 10 and following. I hear this all the time, ah, it's too big a conspiracy. There's two, uh, look, there's uh, how many organizations that are space organizations, how many people work for these people? No, too big a secret, nobody could keep that secret. Too big a conspiracy, really? And what's the motivation, if it is? I'm gonna challenge that. Is it really too big a conspiracy? I don't think so. Compartmentalization alone refutes that idea. Uh, if you've ever been in the military or anything, you understand how compartmentalization works. How many of you know the, the private has no idea what the general knows? <laughs> you know, and there are a whole lot of people in between that have various, you know, uh, you know, privy to various information that others don't have. Look into the Manhattan Project. Look how many people were involved with the Manhattan Project, how much money was involved with that. The guy in the room next door didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know what he was doing, you know, if you were working on that project. The Vice President of the United States didn't even know what was going on with that. That's a really good example of lots of people working on a project with lots of money and nobody having a clue what the other person knows. So no, they wouldn't have to all be in on it. Because that's one thing I hear, well the teachers have to be in on it, and this guy had to be, every airline pilot, no, most of these people have no idea. The mechanic doesn't know what the king knows. Uh, and if you really want to dive deep into how various nations could easily be in on it, because it, it was like, what about the Russians? Surely they would expose us, or the Chinese, or you know, whoever. Look, I just recommend checking out books like these right here. Uh, Con Conspirator's Hierarchy, the story of the com Committee of 300, or um, Behold a Pale Horse, there's some great books out there. Learn about organizations like the Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Jesuits, the Trilateral Commission, Bilderberg Meetings, Bohemian Grove, Committee of 300, Council of 13, and this is just the tip of an iceberg of a, <laughs> of a very big control system. Once you realize how big this iceberg is, you realize uh, this is a massive beast system of control. And, th and that all our media, all the media that we have in this country is owned by six, I would just go ahead and speculate, probably Luciferian run corporations. So if all of our media, all our print media, our radio media, our, our television media, everything that we get for information is controlled by six organizations, how many of you realize, can you now see how easy it is to control that narrative? Put a picture in a textbook. Make a statement in a textbook. Put a kid in public school with a globe in the corner. Kid has no reason to question the person in the front of the room. He's put there by his parents, that, you know, presumably he trusts. Parents put him in this room, so that must be a trustworthy guy or gal, that woman, you know, at the front. So I'm gonna believe him. That's pretty easy. Control the narrative, control the media. What government is trustworthy? Can you name any other than the kingdom of Yah? I can't think of any. Governments are full of conspiracies. The military answers to its government. When it comes to people who've been to space, there's been something like 550 human beings in the entire world who have allegedly been to space. The majority of them uh, are Americans. And of the 375 Americans, 216 of them served our country in one capacity or another in the military. Um, look, how many of you know military, you know, we're trained to keep secrets? You know, from the lowest level, a private, right? Then they have different secret clearances and stuff that you'd have, uh, depending on what your job description is and stuff like that. Your job is to guard the nation's secrets, you know, right? So, yeah, no problem there. Military guards secrets. Space programs answer to their governments, which we just established are not trustworthy. All nations who signed the Antarctic Treaty are suspect. I don't have time to get into that here. You'll have to watch some of my other videos and other videos online about that. Secret societies, well, yeah, they keep secrets. <laughs> Go figure. You know, so you have you know, 200 and something of the 300 and something astronauts are in the military, military trained to keep secrets, and many of those within those numbers are Freemasons who keep secrets. Most are just doing their job and they have no reason to question it. They build stuff. They read data on computer screens. NASA is all about imagination, about oh, the awe of space and, and getting people involved in that. George A. Keyworth is the, was the science advisor to Ronald Reagan. He said to Congress in 1985, all government agencies lie part of the time, but NASA is the only one I've ever encountered that does so routinely. Okay. How about this quote I found from a Los Angeles Times 1987 article or something like that, the middle quotation there, he says, all of the organizations that I have dealt with, the only one that lied is NASA, Science Advisor Keyworth said today. 
The reason they lie, of course, is because they are wrapped up in a higher calling. Can you believe that? In their eyes, these are white lies. They tell lies in order to do what has to be done. Because in the end, the result will be for the betterment of the public. So they are not really lying from evil, but nevertheless, they're lying. Crazy. Absolutely crazy. One of the things I found recently is this article. I don't know if you guys have ever heard, there's some scientist named Grimes that did some report on how long it would take for a hoax as big as the moon landings to come out. And he basically said, and this is what you'll see everywhere, is that within five years, the moon landings would have been exposed. Okay? So I've heard that said over and over again, and people on you know, Globe Believer channels will always say that. And I said, well, let me go look at this article really carefully and see, is that really what he says? So you look at the article, and he says that for a plot to last for five years, that all of NASA, when he said that it would last only four years, he was saying that all of NASA was in on it. Well, not one of us believes that. Not one person believes that everybody at NASA was involved in the moon hoax. So I started to say, well, do the numbers change? Well, he keeps going down. He says, for any plot to last five years, only 2,500 people would have to be on the conspiracy. For it to last more than 10 years, you have to have fewer than 1,000 people in on the conspiracy. And for it to last 100 years, you have to have less than 125 collaborators. Well, that's exactly what we're saying. We're saying that only the astronauts and very few people knew. How do we know that? What about all those guys, Jaron, sitting at the consoles? Didn't they know what was going on? Wouldn't they know? They're sitting looking at data. Well, how about Apollo Flight Commander Gene Kranz, who told us in the late 60s, our simulation technology had progressed to the point where it became virtually impossible to separate the training from actual missions. The simulations became full dress rehearsals for the missions down to the smallest detail. It tested out the crews and controllers' responses to normal and emergency evacuations, checked out the exact flight plan and procedures, and it says down at the bottom quote there, the simulations were so real that no controller, so nobody sitting at any console or any computer, could discern the difference between the training and the real mission. So then you have to start looking at the NASA missions, and you say, is there anything else that leads me to believe that possibly there was some chicanery going on? How about the fact that they never plugged the live feed into the news agencies? They said, oh, you want to see the moon landing? Come to our facility, and you can film it off of a TV screen. So you have one input coming from who knows where, and you've got all the media who are actually standing there with video cameras filming off of a screen. That's what we got for the moon landings. <laughs> so there's nobody, I mean, you know, so yeah, based on this guy Grimes' study, if there was less than 125 people who knew about the moon landing conspiracy, it could last 100 years. So unfortunately, we probably got another 50 years that we're going to have to deal with that lie. They lose track over the Indian Ocean. So they build stuff. They put it on this vehicle, they launch it up into the sky, and if you do like a time lapse of these launches, you'll see a very profound arc. <laughs> Doesn't look like they're going up into space, they go whoop, like that. But they saw the device that they just built get put on that thing and go up. And then NASA loses contact with everything they send up over the Indian Ocean. Orion's journey is just beginning. As the spacecraft and the upper stage begin their first lap around Earth, Mission Control in Houston is monitoring the progress of the flight. Orion's over 100 miles up and going about 17,000 miles per hour. Just as it passes over the Indian Ocean, we lose communication. This is expected. The communications link we have through satellites to Orion is momentarily lost. That's convenient. Hmm, look that up. The simulations were so real that no controller, so nobody sitting at any console or any computer, could discern the difference between the training and the real mission. Yeah, but yeah, but they can contact Mars. We've got a remote control doom buddy buggy on Mars. I could barely get cell phone reception in here. You believe some knucklehead sitting there with a, you know, Nintendo <laughs> moving a little doom buggy on Mars? Really? You believe that? I used to believe it. I'll admit it. Yeah, I believed it. Now I think it's completely ridiculous. Look into Devon Island if you really want to go down a rabbit hole and see where Mars is. Devon Island, look into that. Uh, I 
saw a video that Jaronism put out. He basically found Mars right here on Earth on uh, Devon Island, uh, which is just off to the uh, west of Greenland. He was saying that it was Greenland, but it's not actually on Greenland. It's uh, Devon Island. And uh, I did some poking around on there too. I wanted to check it out for myself. And actually, as I was looking around, I actually saw a, a picture that said the Houghton Crater, or Houghton Crater, H-A-U-G-H-T-O-N, Crater Mars on Earth, Devon Island. And, you know, you look at these places and just uh, imagine zooming in on these places and uh, putting a red filter on it. And what do you know? You're on Mars, you know. Um, he found these images right here that are, uh, if you want to check them out, you can go on Google Earth and check it out for yourself. Just make sure you're in the gallery layers. You uh, select Gigapan Photos, and then you'll see these icons show up right here. And so if you click on these Gigapan images, I mean, just even without doing that, this looks like the surface of a weird planet, you know, let's say Mars, you know, just turn it all red and it looks just like Mars. But if you click on these things, you get these uh, panoramic views. It'll zoom in for you right into uh, Google Earth and then show you these panoramas. And uh, they are really interesting. Now, again, just all we have to do is imagine a red filter on this and you're looking out over Mars. But this is actually an island of Canada where NASA has set up some experiments and you'll see right here on their truck, it says Mars Project. So this is the Mars Project in the Arctic. Bunch of uh, ATVs and stuff like that. And you kind of look around and what do you see? You see a rover. Now this isn't uh, the same one that's on Mars, but it's one awfully close to it. Very similar. And it's tooling around in a landscape that looks very much like it could be a Martian landscape. Just change the color. And uh, let's look at a few other ones that he pointed out. Just zoom out so you can see the other ones. Over here. You got this one here. This is Arctic Camp. And sure enough, in the Arctic camp, you can see that they've been here for a while, looks like. And they've got all kinds of antenna equipment and stuff like that uh, for communications, I would presume. There's a NASA truck again, Mars Project. You know, I mean, this landscape out here looks an awful lot like Mars. Now, this back here, I believe is for training purposes. The astronauts can uh, set up shop in there and, and simulate living in uh, Martian conditions, I guess. So fair enough, you know, this is uh, a good training ground, but it also could be a really excellent set <laughs> for more than just training. It could be for Deceiving. I mean, Stanley Kubrick would be proud to have a, a set like this. I mean, he would have been really jazzed, I think. Imagine what he could have done with, you know, a shot like this for a Mars landscape, right? A practical set. We'll look at the one more here. This one right here. And, you know, here we go. 
Nice Martian landscape once again. And here's our little rover guy. Do 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 do. Looks like a different one, maybe. Tooling around in the Martian landscape. So, I mean, it's this sort of thing that, okay, it could be innocent. Sure, could be, could be. Maybe this is just, you know, all for training purposes, trying to simulate a similar environment and t uh, cold temperatures and stuff like that. I get it. But then again, it could. I mean, it is at least plausible for them to be using a place just like this. And there are a whole lot of images. You just do, you know, fake Mars images or fake Mars pics or whatever on a Google search. And you'll see a lot of people out there are really taking a look at the Mars pics and showing that they very well could have originated right here on Earth just with a red filter on it. Oh, by the way, Mars just so happens to look exactly like some of the places here on Earth. <laughs> Imagine the coincidence. It's incredible. It's a little more red. Oh, and by the way, they got rodents up there, too. <laughs> you know, they, wow. Imagine the coincidence. How cool is that? There's life on Mars. Squirrels. <laughs> No, they're up in Devon Island. You can go look this up on Google Earth for yourself. Why do we have to go to Devon Island to test? It's just a little doom buggy going around on dirt and rocks. We've got plenty of dirt and rocks right here. Why do we got to go to Devon Island? Oh, because it's cold. You, you could put it in an ice box and still simulate cold if you want to see if it can handle the cold. No, they're going to Devon Island because nobody else is up there, and it just so happens to look like what we think Mars looks like. Unbelievable. Oh, but Elon Musk. First of all, how many of you have ever heard the name Elon before you heard of Elon Musk? Anybody? A college by the name of Elon. Interesting. I'd never heard the name Elon before I heard of Elon Musk. How interesting, though, that Werner von Braun, Captain Nazi NASA guy himself, right, wrote a fiction novel, I think it was in the late 1950s, about a colony on Mars. It just so happened to be led by a guy named Elon Oh, imagine the coincidence. Oh, but now we've got a Tesla on the way. Did you hear about that? He shot up a car, supposedly. And he himself said, you know, it's got to be real because it looks so fake. But what was going through your mind? How, how amazed were you to see your roadster up there with Starman uh, just cruising along with the Blue Planet? And how long will we be getting live views, do you think, from the car? Well, I think it looks so ridiculous and impossible. Um, and you can tell it's real because it looks so fake, honestly. <laughs> because it did look fake. But a whole lot of people, <laughs> look, they got a Tesla flying around the Earth. It just made a pass around the sun from what I heard. Now it's on the way to Mars, I guess. Okay, but now here's something else that's really interesting. Look at this car. Look at the tires. Look at the plastic and the leather and other things. Listen to this. But we you know we didn't really test any of those materials for, you know, is it space hardened or whatever, you know. So it just has the same seats that a, like a normal car has. It's just literally a normal car in space, which I kind of like the absurdity of that. Yeah, it is quite absurd. Now, I went to the Contact in the Desert conference earlier this year, and this individual here, David Adair, uh, claims to be a materials specialist working for NASA, allegedly testing various materials uh, before they put it on objects that are supposed to be sent out into space. All right, now listen to what he has to say about testing these materials. In the material sciences, um, in that environment, it's not friendly out there, y'all. It's, it's 225, 250 degrees below zero on the shadow side, 250 above on the sun side. So right through the meridian line, you've you're got a 500 degree difference. It's a total vacuum. There's ultraviolet rays, gamma rays, uh, infrared, all unfiltered by the atmosphere. It just burns things up when they hit it. Some of our materials just absolutely disintegrated. They were gone. We just had a blank where we put the piece of material. Okay, so if this guy's testimony is true, then he just completely de debunked this. 
I mean, look at the rubber on the tires. You know, the the tires aren't exploding. The rubber's not disintegrating. Any plastic on there is not, you know, frying. And it's spinning, so it's going 500-degree temperature range from 250-plus to negative 250-plus as it's in direct sunlight and then, you know, spinning out of direct sunlight. And yet the glass is fine, the plastic's fine, the rubber's fine, the leather's fine. Everything's okay. It's just a regular car that Elon Musk himself said basically just pulled right off the lot and supposedly shot it up into space. So, yeah, I agree with Elon. It does look fake. And the whole thing is completely absurd. And I think anybody who believes this is actually real probably needs to have their head examined. We'll believe anything nowadays. Oh, by the way, they found the Star Trek symbol on Mars, too. Did you know that? Oh, this is real. CNN right there. A couple months ago, June 13th. We found the Star Trek symbol. Starfleet's been there already. <laughs> wow. Not only did they find one, they just found a whole bunch of them. Look at this, a whole fleet of Star, Star Trek symbols. Just so happened to be on Mars. You know what? They're punking you. They're laughing at you. Just as they were laughing at me just a few years ago when I bought all this garbage. The conspiracy of cosmology is no bigger than that of evolution. So if you can accept that evolution is a lie and you can get behind the Kent Hovens of the world, and again, I think these guys are doing great work. Is everybody in on the conspiracy of evolution? Or are most people just deceived and they're parroting what somebody else who was also deceived told them? I submit to you that the, 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 that the science of cosmology is no different than the science of biology in terms of how they're deceiving us and who is have to be in on it. Very few people would have to be in on it. And uh, just put it in a textbook, and no one questions it. Uh, when uh, Sheila and I had our 10th anniversary, it was my sister's and, and brother-in-law's 20th anniversary, and it was my parents' 50th. So our whole family had some big numbers right there. With my, my mom's like, we should all do something. So we went on a big family cruise to Hawaii, and um, we did some excursions and stuff, and we are doing some snorkeling. And I'm, I'm swimming, and, and we're looking at the different fish and coral and all kinds of stuff, and had a great time, get on the boat, ride back, and the tour guide that, that took us out there, she's going through all the various fish that we saw in the, in the plant life and coral and whatnot. And she's talking all in evolutionary, ev evolutionary terms. And was very eloquent. And when we got to the dock, uh, the couple that was in front of us as we were getting off the boat said, you know, that was a great presentation. That was really wonderful. And this young girl, probably in her 20s, said, you know, thank you so much. I, I was just glad that I was finally able to put my degree to good use. And I thought about that. I'm like, you know, She's innocent. She went to school, listened to somebody that she thought was trustworthy, parroted what they said with passion and zeal and conviction. Right? Was she in on the conspiracy of evolution? No. No more than the guy that's building a satellite that gets put on a thing that goes like this off the, off the launch pad. You know, there wouldn't have to be a whole lot of people in on it, so to speak. So, what is the motivation? What's the motivation here? I think this billboard says a lot. <laughs> this billboard, in science we trust, freedom from religion foundation. And scientism, make no mistake, scientism, I believe real science, again, confirms scripture. I'm talking about science falsely so-called. That is in and of itself a religion known as scientism. And they have their prophets. I made this little meme right here because I listened to what these guys say and I'm like, why does anybody believe anything that they say? I got Einstein saying, I draw on chalkboards. <laughs> wow, dude, cool. Neil deGrasse Tyson said that when it comes to understanding the universe, we are 96% stupid. Now he's supposed to be in the top tier of intellectuals in this country and he admits that when it comes to cosmology, they are 96% stupid. Got the video clip of him saying it. Carl Sagan, who I've made fun of a few times, billions and billions of years ago, said that we evolved from microbes and muck, and apes are our cousins. You know, we think we're so smart, right? We think we're so smart we, that we came from a microscopic dot that exploded 
right, and spun off and somehow congealed into fireballs that also exploded and sent space dust, stardust everywhere that we are composed of stardust, apparently, right, and planets cooled around them into molten lava that somehow managed to pop out life. Life evolved not just from monkeys. You know, they say the humans evolved from monkeys, but you take it further back, and the first life form evolved out of molten lava. You believe, Ken Hovind puts him on the spot. He says, wait a minute, you, you believe we evolved from a rock? Because that's what they believe. And that we evolved from goo to you by way of the zoo to the point now we don't even know how many genders there are. I'm a monkey, and I don't know what gender I am. <laughs> really? <laughs> Right? Are you guys seeing the news? <laughs> Thousands of years, right? You know, parents have babies. They hold it up. Got something between the legs, right? It's a boy! <laughs> now we can't figure it out for some reason. Whatever. You know, we got this other guy, you know, Lawrence Krauss. We are all stardust. And, this, and the stardust in your right hand is probably from a different star than the one in your left hand. Okay, dude. Uh, you know, we got this... Um, Oh, I forget his name now. Hawking, Stephen Hunk Hawking. I'm like, do you even know? But, uh, how do you know I really said that? How do you know he really said that? His computer's talking, but how do you know he said it? Uh, you got Dawkins. Well, nobody knows how it happens, but we believe it. You know, he believes it's fact, but you pin him down to how many of you guys saw Expelled? Have you guys seen the, the, if you haven't seen the documentary Expelled, you have to watch it and see how completely intellectually bankrupt these people are. We're Johnny Come Latelys. We live in the cosmic boondocks. We emerged from microbes and muck. Apes are our cousins. You don't believe that the Earth is round only if you're an astronaut. You don't believe Napoleon existed only if you're a historian. You believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. Evolution is also a demonstrated fact. The truth really is out there. It's not a matter of opinion. You have, uh, you have written that uh, God is a psychotic delinquent invented by mad, deluded people. No, I didn't say quite that. I said something rather better than that. Oh, well, please tell us what you said. Please tell us what you said. <laughs> um, I, well, I would have to read it from, from, from the book. No, please. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. So uh, you believe it's liberating to uh, tell people that there is no God? I think a lot of people, when they give up God, feel a great sense of release uh, and freedom. Well, then who did create the heavens and the earth? Why do you use the word who? You see, you, you, you immediately beg the question by using the word who. Well, then how did it get created? Well, um, by a very slow process. Well, how did it start? Nobody knows how, how it started. We know the kind of event that it must have been. We know the sort of event that, that must have happened for the origin of life. And what was that? It was the origin of the first self-replicating molecule. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone nor has else. Anybody. Evolution is a fact. It's documented by science. Right, how did that happen? I told you, we don't know. Believe these things because they're facts proved by evidence. So you have no idea how it started? No, 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 no nor has anybody. Nor has anyone else. What do you think is the possibility that, there, that intelligent design might turn out to be uh, the answer to some issues in uh, genetics or in, well, in evolution? It could come about in the following way. It could be that uh, at some earlier time, somewhere in the universe, a civilization e evolved by probably some kind of Darwinian means to a very, very high level of technology and designed a form of life that they seeded onto perhaps this, this planet. Um, now, th that is a possibility and an intriguing possibility. Mm. And I suppose it's possible that you might find evidence for that if you look at the, um, at the detail, details of biochemistry, molecular biology, you might find a signature of some sort of designer 
Wait a second. Richard Dawkins thought intelligent design might be a legitimate pursuit? Um, and that designer could well be a higher intelligence from elsewhere in the universe. Well, but that I'm... higher intelligence would itself have had to have come about by some explicable or ultimately explicable process. It couldn't have just jumped into existence spontaneously. That's the point. So Professor Dawkins was not against intelligent design, just certain types of designers, such as God. Many, many people are extremely illogical. You got this other guy here. I'm just an actor. <laughs> he, I think he's got like an engineering degree or something, but he's no scientist. He's an actor. And Michio Kaku said, when it comes to cosmology, we're off by a factor of 10 to the 120th power. They're off by 10 to the 120th power. I'm kind of like, well, why don't you knock off 100 <laughs> zeros and get back to us? Theoretical physics uses math and theory in order to come up with or derive the fundamental laws of nature and to make conclusions from these laws. Yep, ideas and mathematics giving little to no weight to experiments or observations. Sounds fun, huh? Books have been written and questions have been asked because to some it has become obvious that physics has been stuck for years because the belief in beauty and math have become so dogmatic that it now conflicts with scientific objectivity that a focus on mathematical elegance rather than reality has led the so-called science astray. It reminds me of a quote from Nikola Tesla, who of course was a real scientist, not a theoretical physicist, who said, the scientists from Franklin to Morse were clear thinkers and did not produce erroneous theories. The scientists of today think deeply instead of clearly. One must be sane to think clearly, but one can think deeply and be quite insane. Today's scientists have substituted mathematics for experiments and they wander off through equation after equation and eventually build a structure which has no relation to reality. Nikola Tesla. Things like dark matter, string theory, the Big Bang, quantum gravity, relativity, and so much more have all come from the minds of theoretical physicists. Let's list some of these theoretical physicists because maybe you've heard of some of them. Nicholas Copernicus, who formulated the Copernican principle that the Earth or human beings could not possibly be in a privileged position in the universe. Or Giordano Bruno, who told us that the stars are just like other suns. Or Galileo Galilei, who pushed the ideas of heliocentrism. Or Johannes Kepler, who came up with mathematical laws of planetary motion. Or Isaac Newton, whose cannon-shooting thought experiment gave rise to gravity. Or Christian Huygens, who in 1653 came up with the distance from Earth to the sun when he guessed, yes, guessed, they say correctly by chance, the size of Venus, allowing him to measure the Earth to the Sun distance. Or Father George Lemaitre, the Jesuit, who came up with the idea of the Big Bang. Or Henry Cavendish, who used balls in his shed to correctly come up with the mass and weight of the Earth. Or Max Planck, who was the originator of the quantum theory. Or Albert Einstein in relativity and the bending of space-time. To more recently, Lawrence Krauss, who tells us that something can come from nothing if you have gravity, or Michu Kaku, who tells us all about string theory. Of course, there are thousands more. To see a pretty decent list, check out the link in the description to Wikipedia, where you can see the many other names like Stephen Hawking, Richard Feynman, Ernst Mach, Max Born, Ernest Rutherford, James Clark Maxwell, the list goes on and on. But I want to come back to one in particular to help us answer our question, and that is Michu Kaku. In a recent interview, Michu Kaku said the following, now listen carefully, as I believe he gives us the answer pretty much straight up. You're not going to believe this. In science, we always say that you make observations, you have a theory, you go make more observations, and it's a very, very tedious process. Wrong. Nobody that I know of in my field un uh, uses the so-called scientific method. In our field, it's by the seat of your pants. It's leaps of logic. It's guesswork. In that quote, I believe we find our answer. He said, plain as day, that nobody that he knows of in his field, and his field is theoretical physics, uses the so-called scientific method. Why is that so important? Well, it is so important because when we look at the definition of pseudoscience, we see clearly and everywhere that by definition, pseudoscience is a collection of beliefs or practices mistakenly regarded as being based on the scientific method. Yes, pseudoscience consists of statements, beliefs, or practices that are claimed to be both scientific and factual, but are incompatible with the scientific method. One more time, in case you missed it, 
from Michu Kaku himself. Wrong. Nobody that I know of in my field un- uh, uses the so-called scientific method. And when you don't use the scientific method, what you practice is no longer called science. It's simply called pseudoscience. In our field, it's by the seat of your pants. It's leaps of logic. It's guesswork. 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 Just great. And do some research on the difference, and you will see what we are being fed as factual and reality is simply guesswork. This chart shows the characteristics of pseudoscience versus actual science. Pseudoscience avoids falsifiability. It has vagueness in measurement. It takes what is unproven as false equals true. It has confirmation bias. It spends money and resources without care and has a reversed burden of proof. Hmm. Sounds a lot like the Big Bang. Universe expansion, dark matter, relativity, space-time, black hole science, unification theory, the theory of everything, supersymmetry, string theory, gravity, and on and on the list goes. So next time you hear these theoretical physicists talking nonsense, make sure you remember that the evidence speaks for itself. But it's up to you to decide. Is theoretical physics pseudoscience? I think the answer is clearly yes. Or you can continue to believe these guys and take the things they say as fact, like when we asked Michu Kaku to explain string theory. Because we have a theory called string theory. It is fantastic. It is incredible. It has astounded the world of mathematics and physics. And now you can't move in the physics world without bumping into somebody who wants to talk about the 10th dimension, the 11th dimension, the multiverse, hyperspace, time travel. All the things that were once considered science fiction are now centerpiece in our understanding of the nature of everything. Yes, the 11th dimension, the multiverse, hyperspace, and time travel, things that are so clearly science fiction, are now centerpiece in our understanding of reality. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Through your career and your writing and your acting, you've inspired so many people to enter the sciences. How do you balance science with science fiction? They're both the same. I've been discussing time and warping time and time space uh, with some famous scientists. I'm doing something up in Canada which may sell, uh, uh, they may sell that show called The Truth is in Our Stars. And I've talked to um, Michio Kako and uh, David Suzuki and, and I'm going in a couple of weeks to talk to Stephen, Dr. Stephen Hawking. And, and I tried to get uh, through his book, A Brief History of Time. It's not brief. <laughs> it doesn't have much to do with history. And I, everybody I've met who uh, is uh, acquainted with the subject, I, I'm continually asking, <clears throat> look, I hear space-time all the time. No, it's space-time. It's space-time. That without space, without time, it's time and the space, and the space is the time. Hard to comprehend what it is. Well, I don't comprehend what it is, so I ask these very important people who are working in the field, what is space time? And they say, well, the gravitational force takes the, 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 the photon of a light and avenges the photon of the light. So without space, without time, you cut the time that comes. I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. If in 13, and I said this to uh, Dr. Kaka, uh, in 13.5 years, he says, no, 13.8 billion years. He corrected me by 0.3 billion years. <laughs> if, if, if that photon, I said to him, if that photon of light, if that farthest galaxy, takes 13.8 billion years to reach my eye, isn't that time? And he said, yes, but the space time and the time and the space and the space and the time. <laughs> and I couldn't understand, I still, my opening sentence to everybody, including it will be to Dr. Hawking, what is space time? And I can't, and I know 17 people just raised their hands, I'll tell you about space time. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concept that I just can't get through my head. Well, you can understand time, the passage of time. Are you gonna explain to me what space time is? Yes. 
and you can understand the idea that uh, there's space, there's a distance between you and these 6,000 people. Wow. Uh, you said that with a measure of pride, too. <laughs> yeah. uh, Creation of uh, 6,000 people are in the office. But it takes a certain amount of time yes. for you to pass from here all the way over to the other side of the auditorium. Right, that's space. That is time going, that is a time going through space. You see, that's not what they mean at all. <laughs> that shows me that you have no idea. I mean, so the guy said, one of the gentlemen said, well, there are three dimensions, space, uh, 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 length, uh, uh, width, right? And then you have the concept of time. As the so something dimension. happens within that space, you got time. That's the fourth dimension. Yeah. And I said, well, I, I, I get that. Something happens within a cube, and you, you have time, and then you have length and breadth and, and width. And, and I get the, what's the fifth dimension, I said? That's a, a fantastic band. A fantastic band. That, that, that was my first thing. So I said, just give me another, because he said there's 11, then he said there's seven, 17, and then I heard lately there's 26 other uh, 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 spaces. Uh, uh, dimensions. Dimensions. Multiverses. So, so, no, wait a minute. So I said, well, just give me one other dimension. I don't care about 16 or 17 or 26. What is the fifth dimension? What is the... Give me another dimension. And the answer is, <clears throat> we can't conceive of that. You know, right. so, 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 that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't mean it does exist. <laughs> you know, so I mean, how, how, so I said to Dr. Kaku, he, he said, uh, it, it's, it's in the, because he's working on string theory. You know about string theory. Yeah, and I find that incredible. Yeah, he does, we too. But we're not talking about the stuff you wrap a package about. Adam. Yeah. It's vibration of some kind in a string. Okay? So I said, how, he said, it's like music. I said, well, I understand an orchestra with vibrating instruments. I got that. What do you play? What's your instrument? What do you do when you get up in the morning, doctor? What? What do you do? And he says, it's all in my head. I think. I said, well, how do you prove what you're thinking exists? Because it's all theory. He said, well, I've got this very elegant uh, uh, numbers, equation, equation, yeah. Very E, B, divided into seven to four. <laughs> it's all in his head. How do, how do you prove a black hole? How do you know those gravitational waves proved the collision of two black holes? Somehow, eventually, they are able to observe phenomena. No, they that... can't observe. <laughs> it's too far away. It's too theoretical. They're telling us that there's all of these different Earth-like planets out there, right? How many of you guys have been following the news on that? You know, they keep saying, that video I just showed you a minute ago, really all they were looking at is, is a couple of, you know, grace blocks. What's even worse, though, is how far away these things are. How far away these things, say, and how far away they say that they're looking, right? Do you, do you know how far a light year is? One light year is approximately six trillion miles. They're telling us we're looking across thousands of light years. 3,000, that's 3,000 times 6 trillion. Oh, it gets worse than that. They said that they saw a black freaking hole at 55 million light years away. 55 million times 6 trillion. You got a telescope that can see that far? Zoom in on the moon right now and read me the serial number on the bumper of the buggy. Right now. Or shut up. It's outrageous. I mean, it's like every, every month they're trying to see how much further they can push the envelope. How stupid and gullible are we? But that's the evidence we are all using for what we used to believe or what some of you may even still believe to be true about our cosmos. How do we know what they're saying is true? It, you know what it really is? It's all science fiction. <laughs> so does that, does that make you a skeptic? No, 
all science fiction says, this is a story that I'm making up. And, and there's this thing called wormholes. And that's a science fiction concept. Although these scientists says, say there are wormholes. How do you know? The, the mystery of science fiction is what I'm talking about. Science and science fiction are essentially the same. Why are we listening to these people? Well, in conclusion, what's the motivation? This is just my opinion. First, get people to doubt Yahuwah's word by destroying the very foundation of our Bible, Genesis, specifically the creation account. Number two, set up a new paradigm where God is out and science is in. Evolution removes Yahuwah from the equation. Number three, when evolution finally runs its course and becomes utterly bankrupt, introduce the idea of intelligent design, but deny the true designer his due credit and place it rather on ancient aliens. How many seasons are they up to now? That TV show on the History Channel? Ancient aliens on the History Channel. Hmm. Think we're being programmed for something? Promote the ancient alien theme as much as possible in all forms of media by perpetuating the concept of Earth as a tiny blue marble orbiting an average sun and an average galaxy among trillions of other galaxies in an ever-expanding universe. With so much potential for life to exist in such a vast expanse, the idea of alien scientists being our creators seems a lot more plausible over time and heavy indoctrination. And number five. The stage is now set for our alien creators to return and bestow upon us their miracles, signs, and wonders in order to convince all the more that all religions are false. We then put our trust in them. Finally, when Christ does return, we are all convinced that he is the enemy and our united world gathers together to make war with him. The end has been declared from the beginning. I submit to you that this is an important topic and there's probably good reason why it, after all this time, 500 years of the Copernican Revolution. Why are we talking about flat Earth in the years 2015 through 2019 of all things? Could it be that we are going to need to understand and take a stand for what the Word of God says? Remember that we sang that song? Sing it again. The B-I-B-L-E. Are you going to stand alone? on the Word of God. Again, don't believe what I've said here. I've tried to show you as many scriptures as I could, and there's a lot more if I had more time that I could have done so. When they tell me I got two hours to present, I'm like, yeah, cool. At least I got two hours. There's so much more to talk about, and I think it's important. I do not think this is theological junk food. And again, the fruit proves it. Why are atheists coming in? Why are so many people coming into this and getting into Torah. Now, many people in the Christian, standard Christian world don't like that. They're making hit pieces against me on a regular basis. They are actually calling the Torah witchcraft in the doctrine of devils. Well, people are getting into this because this whole thing starts with Genesis, which is in the Torah, by the way. And when you look at Psalm 19, it says the heavens declare and the firmament declares his handiwork this is an important issue to him. He didn't start the narrative talking about the temple. He didn't start the narrative talking about Israel or Jerusalem or who's the chosen people. He gets to that eventually, but Genesis chapter one starts off with, this is how I built this place and I put you in it. The earth is a center stage main attraction. Everything else is for the benefit of the earth. Everything else. I think he's trying to tell us something. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.